I overshot the mic a little bit. That's pretty good. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Uh, I am Dr. Peter Plachan. I'm kind of curious to see how many people we are doing. I think it's okay. Uh, so, uh, welcome everyone to. I'm glad you're taking time out from your Thursday night to join me to get a sense about who our audience is. Uh, can I get by a show of hands how many of you are Mason faculty, staff, or students? How many are not? That's okay, great. A good mix tonight. Glad you could join us. So, I am the director of our observatories. So, I want to tell you a little bit about all the community projects and activities we have going on before I dive into the, the meat of my talk. And I made way too many slides, of course, so I won't be able to get through all of it tonight. And we try to end it like 7 50. So, uh, beautiful fall weather is upon us. You can see in the picture beautiful fall leaves. We have the second largest on campus observatory on the East Coast. On the on the Fairfax campus, on our students love it. Uh, we will see it in pictures later. Uh, we um, use it every clear night, uh, and uh, want to invite you all to come take a look through our telescope uh, on another evening when you when you want. Uh, these are just some pictures taken by our students with the observatory. We have public hours one hour after sunset every Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday. During the academic year, well, they're just up to wrap up. We've got Thanksgiving week next week and then the last week of classes. We don't schedule any schools for the students during the final exam. Uh, so, but we'll be back in February. And we also have lectures every Tuesday evening, uh, or every other Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. in person. We call them Evening with the Star. Uh, and those are always a lot of fun. Uh, we, we sometimes get some quite big crowds. Uh, currently running a talk series in partnership with the Smithsonian Associates. We are on our 20th talk this coming Tuesday night, started during the pandemic. We're in the middle of a grand tour of our solar system. So we've been virtually starting at the sun and working our way outward. We just visited Jupiter last month, and we are headed to Europa on Tuesday night. So more information about that, you can just Google or, or take a picture of the link there. We're going to talk about Europa and fascinating possibilities of oceans and the ice, the possibility of life. And it's been a really interesting journey. Uh, for those of you that may have some high school age uh, uh, peers or friends or, or family members, we have a summer six week uh, young active scholars internship that uh, we've had two years of now. Uh, and students get to use our telescope and uh, do a research project with it. Uh, also experimenting this fall with a machine learning based course. Uh, and uh, all this information you can find out more about our website, science.community.edu/observatory. Next, uh, for middle school age students, we have the Interstellar Green Space Center on our campus. And it's basically summer space camp, although I can't use the word space camp, there's a trademark. Uh, my other space camp in Huntsville, Alabama. So it was a space center coming to uh, And we just had our first summer this last summer. That's my nine-year-old. She was our first test subject at camp during the first week last summer. It was actually great for some. We're doing it again. Uh, did any of you come to our space day just a few weeks ago? No? Well, if you haven't heard about it, we're in our second year. We're going to have to save this date, September 28th, 2024. I think we finished getting pictures on it. But we have an astronaut over the first two years come and be our keynote speaker. We have organizations from around what's going on on zone. We have organizations, I'm back down on time, right? I forgot that we, that's exactly what happened. It's going to go forward about seven minutes again. But we had um, 2,200 people registered for the event just a couple of months ago. And we're growing uh, with representatives from NASA and the local area organizations involved in space exploration, including one group of high school students who have their own rocket company. We want to talk about transformative changes in society. Among you heard about the discovery of exoplanets. Well, high school students are building a rocket to launch into the space. Something you wouldn't even think would have been possible a decade ago, but they're working on it and they have a real test stand and everything. It's, it's, it's remarkable. 
um, another event that nature has planned for you, I want to make sure everyone knows about, is a total solar eclipse crossing the United States on April 8th, 2024. Uh, we are not in the path of totality. I saw the total solar eclipse in 2017, and the only word I could come up to explain what it was like to experience that was feeling. It really was unlike anything I'd ever experienced in my life. And I'm a professional astronomer. I like, I, I've, I've been at the biggest telescopes in the world, these telescopes in space, but this was really a transformative experience. So make your plans now, if you haven't, if you can, for the path of totality. It's going to start uh, passing through uh, San Antonio, Texas, in the U.S., and kind of exit the U.S. around Buffalo, New York. It's just a few minutes. And you'll have better luck with the weather, which you can't control further to the south. If you can't make it to the top of totality, it is a different experience. But here in uh, northern Virginia, we have about 80% of the sun covered, uh, which is more than we had uh, during the cloudy weather back on October 14th and the last uh, partial solar eclipse uh, just a couple months ago. So if you want to follow and find out more about all these different activities that we're doing here uh, at the observatory, you can subscribe to our newsletter, The Moon, the observatory outreach newsletter. It was originally coming out monthly. Moon, moon cycle. If you didn't know the word month comes from moon. It looks like it's a line. Uh, also, something you may not know, we use astronomy every time you say what day of the week it is. Today's Thursday. Does anyone know what that is in Spanish? Jueves, Thursday is Jupiter, Wednesday, Miracles, Mercury, Tuesday, Martes, Mars, uh, Saturday, Saturn, Sunday, Sun, Monday, the Moon, so, and a Friday, Uranus, right? Uh, uh, but in any event, the days of the week are actually tied to the visible planets, the Sun, and the Moon, the visible and the sky. And uh, it's 7, 10 p.m. The p.m. actually refers to the position of the sun. So whether or not you know it, you are using astronomy every day. So sign up for our newsletter to find out more fun facts and events related to astronomy out there. Uh, if you're interested, we also have a philanthropic organization, the Patrons of the Observatory, to continue and promote a lot of these activities that we're doing in the D.C. region. And I'd like to thank our many uh, patrons that have supported the work that we've been doing over the past six years that I've been here. Uh, we have a huge team. Uh, here's some pictures of the students in the upper right. And we have huge crowds. This was our crowd for the Zoom Summit uh, a year ago. We had like over 200 people out in the So it was quite active, and you wouldn't know it if you're on the Fairfax campus during the day because we're, we're strong and we're active at night time. Uh, but I have a huge team. I'm the director. We have our deputy director, graduate teaching assistant, our student club shown in the upper right having a, a solar sidewalk astronomy day. Uh, they are very proud of being the seventh largest student club on campus, even head of the anime club. So uh, it's a wonderful student group. Like I said, they love our observatory. Um, it's a real treasure uh, for our campus. So on to the, my main part of my talk, how to find Earth 2.0. Have we found it yet? No, not yet. Um, and so I'm going to tell you where the, we have found our size planets. Uh, we have found planets that have the right temperature. But we haven't found the right combination. And I'm going to tell you why. And NASA has a goal in the 2040, this is a bit of an older animation, to launch a mission into space that's a bit like the successor to the Webb Space Telescope, but bigger, better, and operational at shorter wavelengths. And one of its primary science goals, you can see it unfolding here, you know, maybe the half the size of a football field with a sun shield. This is not the final design. This is just one of possibly many designs. But one of its goals is to take pictures of space. So this is what our solar system would look like as imaged by this telescope that NASA is going to launch in 2040 if our solar system was 33 light years away. And no, the solar system isn't orbiting a black hole. 
We're just using technology to block out the light from the stars. How hard is that? Well, I'm going to talk about that. And why oh, haven't we done it yet? But some questions that we're answering right now in preparation for this mission are how many stars are we going to need to look at? How big and expensive does that telescope need to be? The Webb Space Telescope, $10 billion. A lot of money. And there's actually a team competing with a private team, a philanthropic team, competing with NASA right now to see if they can do the next mission for much cheaper. So that isn't public information yet. Don't share that with us. It will be public in a little bit. But there's some interesting competition and interesting opportunity ahead if the launch of the next Starship rocket is successful. It's now scheduled for Saturday, so leading end. So lots of TV. Uh, uh, yeah, check out SpaceX on Saturday morning and see that rocket. So I want to see this picture before I retire. It's kind of what my career is. That's the apex I'm looking for um, as I um, become an associate professor and get older. So, but what is an exoplanet? An exoplanet is a planet that orbits another star. This particular planet is called 55 Tancri E. Tancri is the constellation. 55 is a number of the star in the constellation. E means it's the fourth planet that was discovered in the system. This one's a really cool planet because you get to have your birthday every day. Its orbital period is less than one day. So it goes around its sun, its year, lasts less than an Earth day. So you get to have its birthday every day on this world. Problem is, it's molten lava on the surface. So if you want to go there, um, maybe you can talk to uh, Anakin Skywalker, because uh, I think he was, what was the name of that world, Mustafar, something like that? Do you remember? You forgot it? Okay. Uh, but my career, speaking of science fiction, my career has witnessed the transformation of science fiction into science fact. There are over 5,500 worlds that have been confirmed or validated to orbit other stars. Many of them are like this hot, lifeless world. Not all of them. So I'm going to try and not show you too much science plots today, but this is what's called a log log plot of the number of confirmed and or statistically validated planets, if that's the thing that needs to do it, uh, as a function of their orbital period and their mass. And you can actually see there's three clumps. There's this red clump, this green clump, and then like a red green clump down here. I can't believe it's a Christmas color theme. Uh, and then some blue dots over here. And the colors mean how they were discovered. And if I were to put Earth on uh, this plot, it would lie right there. Earth looks pretty lonely. Uh, but granted, this plot is almost two out of date, but I can tell you it hasn't been filled in very much. So as of today, there are no planets that we've discovered with an orbital period similar to that of the Earth and a mass or radius similar to that of the Earth. There's a few that have come close. And this well, runs a wide dynamic range. The orbital period of these planets down here less than a day. These are these what we call ultra short period planets. There's nothing like it in our solar system. In fact, the shortest orbital period planet in our solar system is Mercury. It takes 90 days to go around the sun. If I put that on this fly, well, well, first of all, it'd be off on, on the, it's very low mass. But um, its orbital period is right here. So all of these planets in green have orbital periods interior to what would be Mercury in our solar system. Thousands of these worlds that we found, we don't have anything like it in our solar system. So it begs the question, what is going on? Why do these star systems have worlds unlike the ones we have in our solar system? Is our solar system unique? Uh, and then we have these red, massive Jovian worlds, actually very similar to Jupiter. Uh, that, so it turns out that about six to seven percent of stars ha uh, have a, a Jupiter-sized world in a similar location to our own Jupiter. But then a bunch, about one percent, although we discovered a lot of them because it's easier to find, have hot Jupiters, worlds the size of Jupiter, which, mind you, is three hundred times the mass of our own Earth, orbiting their star once every four to ten days. Again, there's 
there's no hot Jupiter in our solar system. Very bizarre. What's going on? And why is the Earth lonely? So in order to understand why the Earth's lonely, we need to talk about how we find the planet. And my title of my talk, how to find Earth 2.0. Kind of the simplest method to understand is direct image. So if we zoom in on the star Beta Pictoris B, it's very bright. And we're trying to see the pink glow plant next to it. So we need some kind of technology to block out the light from the star. In this particular case, in the 1980s, we found that it was surrounded by a disk of gas and dust, which is a baby star system. And in 2003, we saw a blip on one side of the star, and then it disappeared in 2007, so they thought it was just garbage. And then it appeared again two years later on the other side of the star. And so this was the discovery of a planet five to ten times the mass of Jupiter, or being a, 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 this star is about the same distance as our own Jupiter. And we were able to see this world because it's so young, it's so hot from its formation. We're able to see the thermal radiation from this planet. If it was an older star like our sun, we wouldn't have been able to see it. So they went back and made a movie. And in the 2000s, this was the best movie that had ever been made of uh, another world. I got a little bit better after that. We discovered the HR8799 system. I thought it was a crazy naming thing. Um, and so there are plants B, C, D, and E. And you could actually see them orbiting the star, a little Keplerian system. These are artifact, artifacts of the subtracting the starlight. So, so how hard is this? Now, again, this was a young star system with worlds many times the mass of our own Jupiter. And further out, too, this particular system, the star is about twice the mass of our sun, and the planets are like five times as massive, and they're further out, too. So what is the challenge of direct imaging? Well, the analogy is like seeing a firefly next to a searchlight. Except we're here trying to look at that searchlight and see the firefly, and the searchlight's in Los Angeles. For every 10 billion photons of light we get from the star, we get one from an Earth-sized world orbiting a sun-like star. And with today's technology, we can't do that. The technology to do it is actually almost a century old. It's called Leo coronagraphy. It's actually invented the study of the sun. We're not going to go into the details here. Uh, but it only blocks out 99% of the light. So here's a real raw image uh, from my colleague, Shane Curry, of this system. And it's uh, from the Keck telescope, the world's largest ground-based optical telescope in the world. And even after getting rid of 99% of the light from the star, there's still a ton of scattered light. And the rest, we had to deal with software. And this is actually from another telescope. But after subtracting the scattered light with software techniques, you're able to see very faint worlds orbiting these stars. In this particular case, this planet is a million times fainter than its sun. So it's a limit of what we can do from the ground. And so the conclusion is that direct imaging is hard. It's currently impossible to get to an Earth-sized habitable world around a sun-like star, which requires us to go not just one part in a million to one part in a billion. We've got like, uh, it's actually one part in 10 billion. We've got four orders of magnitude to go. But NASA is actually now confident after doing some lab test bed demonstrations, and I'll talk about the future at the end of my talk as well, uh, that we should be able to do it by the 24th. But I don't know, four is an attitude factor of 10,000. That's, that's a long way to go. The most popular method and the most successful method for finding worlds around other suns is the transit technique. This is also a relatively easy one to understand. The planet passes in front of the star, which affects our line of sight. And so if we monitor the brightness of the star as a function of time, we can detect these dips in brightness and infer the presence of planets orbiting that sun. Do a bunch of math. We launch a space telescope. And in 2009, the Kepler mission launched. Actually, so in 1999, this is actually the very first discovery of a transiting world. So this is the brightness as a function of time. Uh, and over the course of about one-tenth of a day, so about this is about three hours of data, so about six hours of data total. 
and we saw this star dimmed by 2%. Fun fact, this discovery was made with a four-inch telescope, four-inch diameter mirror, in a parking lot. We had four-inch telescopes since Newton invented them in the 1600s. You know, why, why uh, reflecting telescopes anyway? Why did it take us four more centuries to discover other worlds? The answer is software and techniques and algorithms, uh, because we needed to harness computing power to compare the brightnesses of all the stars in the field of view at the same time. We needed modern detectors that could reliably and accurately record the brightnesses of those stars. But we can do it now. Um, and we've gone from what was done in 1999 Fast forward 10 years, when the Kepler mission launched, we were able to detect changes in brightness of 10 parts per million. Now that may sound amazing that we could find asteroids and comets and all this other great stuff, but it's not so simple. Our sun is about 100 times the diameter of our Earth. We could fit a million Earths inside the sun, about 300,000 times the mass of with less density than it is on average. Uh, so when an Earth-sized planet passes in front of a sun-like star, it blocks 0.01% of the light, which is 100 parts per million. Amazing thing is, we can do that with space-based telescopes now. Uh, for a Jupiter-sized world passing in front of a sun-like star, about 100 times easier, so it's 1 to 2% changes and brightness like that original discovery. So we went in 10 years from finding the first transiting Jupiter-sized world to candidates as small as Mercury uh, with the Kepler mission from 2009 to 2014 or so, about a decade ago. When I used to give this talk about 10 years ago, I called this the golden age of exoplanet science. It seemed like there were so many amazing things. Kepler taught us some amazing science frames, uh, which one, that Earth-sized worlds are common. But it didn't have to be that way, uh, as Lance said in the introduction to my talk, Earth-sized worlds could have been rare. But we didn't get Earth-sized worlds at the right distance, unfortunately. Uh, and that's one of the challenges of the transit method. Uh, NASA then launched the NASA test mission. I guess they were starting to run out of money. The test mission cost $700 million. The test mission, uh, which launched in 2017, uh, was about 150 million. And there were basically four cameras in the sky. They learned from the Kepler mission that they didn't have to stare at the same part of the sky for four years straight, which is what Kepler did. They could instead look at patches of sky for 27 days at a time and look at a bigger yes. field of view to image more of the sky. Tess so, has a simple stare and step observation strategy. Test points anti-solar and remains fixed in inertial space for 27 days or two orbits. Test is a two-year all-sky survey mission with 26 observation sectors or 13 sectors per year. The overlap of the observation sectors near the pole is optimized for JWST's continuous viewing cell. After completing the northern hemisphere in year one, the test transitions to map the southern hemisphere in year two. So when Kepler launched, it only looked at a, what we would call today a tiny piece of the sky, 10 degrees by 10 degrees, enough to fit 100 full moons. Uh, uh, at the time, it was revolutionary and transformative. It was a 100 megapixel camera. Effectively, it was, it was amazing. Uh, so they were like, oh, yeah, that's nothing. Uh, but uh, it had to look at a lot of stars in order to find these transient planets because you need the plant that passes right between us and the star. This Kepler mission doesn't detect worlds that go like this around the star. So it misses most of the worlds. It only catches the ones that have the right orbital inclination. What makes things worse, the further away the planet from the star is, the lower the probability that it'll have that right inclination for us to see it. So going back to that plot I showed you a long time ago, 
happen here. The reason we have so many worlds in green at these very short orbital periods is because they have the highest probability of being detected. They're not the most common type of world. They're just one that's easiest to find. So tests had to look very faint, and they, these candidates were really hard to follow up. So the test mission made it easier to find these worlds. And one of the systems it didn't discover, but is characteristic of some of the systems it found. But today, one of the most famous transiting planet systems is this Trappist-1 system. This was discovered with a ground-based telescope. And if you remember, I said it was hard to find Earth-sized worlds around sun-like stars. Well, screw the sun-like stars. <laughs> They're actually only uh, you know seven to ten percent of the stars in the universe. Seventy percent of them are less than half the size of our sun. So this test mission was exploiting a loophole in nature to look at smaller stars, so that the signal when the planet passed in front of them would be bigger. The same size planet would block more of the light. And so this was probably not. So this was not a test discovery. This was actually found with a ground-based telescope. Uh, but they, this ground-based telescope surveyed stars that were only one-tenth the size of our sun. They're right at the edge of how big or how small a star could be, uh, about 80 times the mass of Jupiter. And they found this system with seven Earth-sized worlds transiting. And it was followed up with uh, TESS and the Jupiter Space Telescope. I think the original ground-based telescope only found the first two or three worlds, uh, but the planets are a bit like brokers, and uh, the people that study galaxies like to probably know this. Where there's one, there's probably more. Uh, they tend to find lots of worlds in the same system. Uh, but this entire system has Earth-sized worlds that are at the right temperature, that if they have an atmosphere and water, that water would be liquid on its surface. Problem was that the star is very dim and very red, and it's unlike our own sun. And there's a lot of open questions about whether or not it could support life. Nonetheless, an amazing discovery. And if you took that system and scaled it into our own solar system, all the planets would fit well within the orbit of Mercury. In fact, Jupiter is a better, and its moons are a better analog for the Trappist One system than our own sun is. Nonetheless, super exciting system. The challenges of the transit method I already mentioned is if you go further away, the probability as a function of distance drops off rapidly. And so it's just really hard to find transient Earth-like worlds. It's less than 0.5%. So we can do it. We can see Earth-sized worlds with the transit method, and it has delivered most of the discovered planets going to date. But it's not good enough to find the Earth-sized worlds around sun-like stars and in addition to that, uh, because the transit probabilities fall, fall off, we won't find the nearest Earth to our own sun this way. We can find some far off ones. Uh, but, and the Plato mission, which will be launched by Europe uh, soon, I think this decade, uh, will eventually search for more of these distant Earth sized worlds. So, direct imaging, kind of out. Transit methods, not going to find the nearest ones. So that leads us to the Doppler technique, which is the second most successful method for finding other worlds. And one of the things I like to say as a scientist, so I, I'm a physicist by training. I'm an experiment. Astronomers really are experimental physicists. We're making measurements. Right? I talk about the 10 parts per million change in brightness, the 1 in 10 million uh, brightness ratio for direct imaging. The Doppler method another one of these techniques that relies very strongly on being very sensitive to minute changes. So everyone has learned in grade school that the planets orbit the sun. Hogwash. Not true at all. In fact, the planets don't orbit our sun, not even our own solar system. They orbit the balance point of the mass in the solar system. It just so happens that are nine, over 99% of the mass in our own solar system is in the sun, but not all of it. So the balance point compared to where the sun is changes as the planets orbit and as a 
star pulls on a planet, according to Newton's third law, the planet also pulls on the star. So the Doppler method is a little bit harder to understand because it's an indirect technique. Since we can't see the planet directly, we look for evidence of the planet by how it tugs on the star. So there's a top-down view in the upper left, uh, an edge-on view on the right. And so if we plot the speed of the star as a function of time, it makes this little sine wave. And by looking at how much the star is moving and how long it takes to make this wave-like pattern, we can infer the presence of a planet orbiting it. And if you've ever heard of the Doppler technique, or um, we call it the radio velocity method, but in the case of uh, sound waves, you might have a race car or an ambulance car as it passes you. The sound waves get compressed as the, uh, the race car or ambulance is coming towards you, and they get stretched out as it recedes from you. The same thing happens to light. So we take the light from a star, we put it through a spectrograph, and we watch the star shift in color as a function of time to measure the speed of the star, and from that, infer the presence of the planet. Turns out, though, it's nuts what we do. It, so let's put things in perspective. Our Earth is one three hundred thousand the mass of our sun. So forget about Earth now. Let's talk about Jupiter. Jupiter is 300 times more massive than the Earth. It's still only 0.1% the mass of the sun. So when Jupiter goes around the sun, it causes the sun to wobble at a speed of only 12 meters per second. So what is that? It's around 40 feet per second. Not a huge amount. For an Earth-sized planet, we have to get all the way down to so what it, we have to get all the way down to turtle speed, nine centimeters per second. So that's about like four inches per second. So the goal of finding Earth-sized worlds with this Doppler technique is watching a star light years away and trying to determine whether it's moving towards us or away from us with a difference in speed equivalent to that of a turtle something that weighs 300,000 times the mass of the Earth, and with all of its flares, spots, spinning. Believe it or not, with the direct imaging method, we are four orders of magnitude away. With the Doppler technique, we're only one order of magnitude, a factor of 10 away in sensitivity. Today, we can find worlds that are jogging towards us in the wake. And that's not quite sensitive enough to find the Earth-like world, uh, but it's getting closer. And there's lots of math to look at that. But in reality, all we're doing is find the speed of the star as a function of time, and we look for a way to infer the presence of a planet. This was actually the first discovered world with this technique in 1995. Uh, for those of you that weren't around in 1995, when this discovery was announced on all the national news, there were reporters stationed somewhere and thought, going, there it is. This discovery was world shattering, as it were. It was the very first discovery that proved beyond a reasonable doubt that there were other worlds out there. People were still skeptical. But within a year or two, um, that skepticism was gone. So today, I, I, this, I made this look easy, right? But it's an incredibly hard measurement to make. And to give you an example of that, this is one of the state-of-the-art spectrographs in the world, uh, located in the high Atacama Desert in Chile, at the VLT, Very Large Telescope European Array. They have four different telescopes that mirrors 32 feet across. Mind you, our campus observatory is 32 inches across. Uh, feeding their light into this vacuum chamber where the wavelengths of the light are recorded very precisely. We're, like I said, we're looking at turtle speed. We're looking at changes in color of one part, and gosh, I don't even know the math anymore, but it corresponds to, on the detector itself, movements of 
tens of atoms on the silicon wafer that the detector is made of. And this started in the 1990s. So this is a plot. It's outdated, but that's okay. It hasn't changed too much since. Um, as a function of time, about how sensitive we were to speed changes. So I mentioned 10 meters per second. So these are Jupiter-sized worlds. And we were getting down to two meters per second about a decade ago. And so we were very hopeful 15 years ago that the discovery of Earth 2.0 was right around the corner. Then we called it Latham's Law. And in fact, in 2015, there was a claim of the discovery of an Earth-sized world orbiting the nearest star system to our own, Alpha Sen. And in 2016, we announced the discovery of Proxima B, uh, a few, I think it's, it's, I think it's still a terrestrial world, orbiting the other uh, star in that nearest star system. So we're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. But then something happened. We stopped discovering worlds at smaller and smaller masses. And if we plot it this way instead, the number of discoveries of worlds with the Doppler technique as a function of time, we're like, oh, golden age, everything's going well. And then we had the great radial velocity market crash of 2015. The discoveries stopped. And the reason why is something that we're still working on solving 10 years later. The entire world of professional astronomers working on the exoplanet Doppler technique are still working on this 10 years later. And it's because of spots and active, active regions on the surface of stars rotating into and out of view, masquerading as the current motion of the star back and forth. Because if a spot is moving towards you, that's an absence of blue shifted light. And when it's receiving it's an absence of red shifted light, it makes the star look like it's moving at the star. So in 2014, we had thought that the, the cool red dwarf star Gliese 581 had a habitable zone to her. Nope. It was just the rotation of the star. The, the funny story about this uh, discovery was that the discoverer had named the planet after his wife, and it turned out to not be a planet. Think about that for a second. What essentially the scientists and I do in my field is that the entire fate the fate of entire worlds hangs in the statistical analysis that we do. It hangs in the balance. Either these worlds exist or they don't. And we have to work very hard with our data analysis and our statistical techniques to verify whether or not they exist. In that case, that world did not. Uh, I guess we could name it uh, after, what should we name that world after? We can name it after uh, all the world. Destroyed. In our analysis. So the Doppler method, very close. A uh, factor of 10 away in sensitivity, but it's become such a big science project that the funding and the cost, there's other logistics that have been a challenge in the US in addition to the data analysis. And I work a lot on this particular area. So I want to start turning a little bit to some of the projects I'm involved in. And Lance didn't mention NASA stuff. So what is some of the NASA stuff I did? Well, I participated in the study that led to the selection of that mission that NASA is going to launch in 2020. So that's really cool. Um, I also led a mission study to use the Doppler technique in space. So I was looking at this problem that we were having with the Doppler technique 10 years ago and said, well, let's put the telescope in space. It'll help us. And we actually got selected by NASA for study. I was a PI. Um, and we submitted it to the National Academy for review in 2020. And they, we also submitted the mission to directly image the worlds um, at 10 times the cost. And the, the direct imaging mission won. We got recommended by the National Academies for NASA's next big flagship mission uh, in the 2040s. Uh, and as a consequence of exoplanet politics, because we got the big mission, we didn't get the second mission too. So the, the, the mission that I proposed, which was about a billion dollar class mission, is not going to happen in the near term future uh, because they recommended that it be an X-ray mission or an infrared mission instead that gave the rest of the non exoplanet astronomers something to do. There's a lot of astronomers complaining that exoplanets have kind of burst onto the field of exciting, everyone's involved. 
all the other astronomers are kind of dead. Um, but I've actually reborn this mission concept as the habitable zone explorer mission concept, scaling it down to um, a $350 million class mission, which is not easy to do. Um, and we are working with NASA JPL right now on the very earliest stages of developing that mission so that we can propose to build it in 2027 is most likely when NASA will ask for proposals to build and fly that mission. That was a little bit of a disappointment, but we got the big mission in the 2030s. So if you combine, so I want to talk and conclude with some of the projects I'm working on. So if you combine the transit techniques and the Doppler technique, you can get them. The Doppler technique gives you the mass of the planet, and the transit technique gives you the diameter. Well, then you can get a density, and you can determine what the planet is made of, and start looking at their atmospheres and dynamical evolution. And so we've been doing that intensely here at George Mason since the test mission launched in 2018, getting the year wrong. Um, and so much so that we've been using our campus observatory to follow up candidates from the NASA test mission. You might ask why we tested in space, how does it win? It turns out in order for the test mission to view huge swaths of the sky, it measures changes in brightness exquisitely but as a consequence of these cameras, it effectively has blurry vision. That was on purpose, so it could get big passes in the sky, but it means that all the candidates that it found were in fact the light of many blended stars. So we have to go in and follow up these candidates and figure out which star actually has the transiting planet. And I've lost track, to be perfectly honest with you, of how many planets our group has helped confirm uh, with our campus observatory. We've had hundreds of nights at COI light curves. And in fact, I just found out that one of my graduate students had 35 paper co-authorships in the last year alone. And he just got his 100th paper co-authorship. He actually beat me this year. I only had 20. Uh, and so we're making so many discoveries I've lost count. This was actually a, one of the most, our most exciting ones, actually taken on Christmas Day uh, in 2019. We discovered a Neptune-sized world where there couldn't be other Neptune-sized worlds uh, in an orbiting a star. It's kind of a rare planet. So that's, we do real research, but not just outreach with our observatory. The light pollution is a huge problem, but we have a scientific niche. Uh, we also have, uh, and we're partners on a facility, um, and now I'm actually a PI as well on this one, uh, in Mount Hopkins, Arizona. We have an array of telescopes with near 70 centimeters diameter, so about 28 inches across. Each one of these costs around 250K. So telescope, Ferrari, telescope, Ferrari. We went with telescopes. And um, so these all collect their light and send them to one of those spectrometers, measuring, using the Doppler technique to look for other worlds. And since then, we've built another one in Australia. I'm going to show you, skip through this very long video and show you kind of what it looks like. It's upside down, it's on the other side of the world. Um, but why did we do this? Because you can't see the same stars. The Earth's in the way. You actually have to have telescopes in both hemispheres if you want to be able to access uh, the whole sky. Probably a better picture of this. But yeah, we've got five of these Pac Man domes. I'll play that while it's open. And then these are all fully robotic, fully autonomous. We upload a target list, they collect their data, we have the data at the end of the night, and then we analyze it. Uh, we also use this bigger telescope with a mirror about 10 feet across in Hawaii uh, on the summit of Mount Akea. And I should have thrown in a couple more fun slides here, but that's okay. Um, this telescope lies on top of a dormant volcano on the big island hawaii about 14,000 feet above sea level everyone looks at me really weird when i get off the plane in hawaii because i get off with my winter jacket it snows up at this elevation it's below freezing at this elevation you get sick your brain gets 60 percent of the oxygen and gets at sea level in other words it's stupid uh, and it takes some time for your blood cell counts to adjust to the altitude but we have a spectrometer on here that operates not at visible light, at near infrared, near infrared wavelengths, 
So it's specially suited for detecting terrestrial world around M dwarf planets. And for a number of years, we carried out a very long campaign of measuring the velocities of stars as a function of time of test candidates. And we have 14 published papers just in the last two, three years from this data set, with another four in prep, collaborating with others, and helping to measure the masses of over 20 of these worlds. And one of these worlds, one of these systems, I like to call the planet discovery that ate my research group. On the very first day, day in December of 2019, that the NASA test mission released its data to the public. The very first white curve I looked at was a star known as AU Mech. AU Mech has a special place in my heart because it is related to something I did during my PhD thesis. It's been known for decades to have a disk of debris orbiting it, like I showed you earlier in the talk. And that disk is perfectly edge on. I thought, hey, well, it's perfectly edge on. And it has planets. The planets are likely to transit. Mind you, this is the very first data from the test mission that we looked at. Uh, and uh, uh, nature gave us a beautiful present. This star is the second closest baby star to our sun at a distance of just under 32 light years, just under 10 parsecs away. And NASA was so excited about it, they made this move. NASA's tech and Spitzer Observatory have found a long thought world orbiting the star AU Microscopia, or AU MIT for short. Located about 32 light years away, the system will be a touchstone for understanding planetary evolution for decades to come. AU MIT is a red dwarf star at least 150 times younger than our Sun. It's so young that a vast bit of dust and icy gray still surrounds it. The planet, AU MIT B, orbits very close to a star within a central zone where the disk material is cleared away. Test data show the newly discovered planet is about 8% larger than Neptune, with no more than about 3.4 times its mass. Test finds worlds like AU Mech B by catching tiny, regular Gibson stars called transits. Spitzer, now decommissioned, confirmed the transits during its final year of operation. The planet's host star is very young. Flares and other phenomena also alter its brightness, which complicated the search. In order to find AU Mix B, the science team had to remove these effects from the data. AU Mix is a nearby laboratory for studying how stars and planets form and evolve. Studying AU Mix B with future missions will also tell us more about the development and evolution of planetary atmosphere. Until then, Tests will continue to hunt for more mysterious worlds, including possibly others orbiting AU Mix. So I, I made this discovery by eye. You would have thought after 20 years of being a professional, and I got my PhD in 2006, so not really for 13 years. And you know, I must have had some sophisticated operating and software. So I just found it with my own two eyes. I plotted the light curve of the brightness of the star as a function of time. This is it um, uh, from my original code. And you can actually see by eye this little dip. I'll, I'll move up it with the mouse online. There's just a little dip right there. And I said, huh. <laughs> and uh, we published it in Nature. You know, we zoom in on it. We can see there was another dip. Also, a third dip. We followed it up with the Spitzer Space Telescope, saw it again. We measured their masses with eye shell. Um, and this is something I'm still quite proud of in terms of measuring the masses was really hard. Uh, remember talking about the activity on the surface of the stars? Well, this is a baby star showing tons of temper tantrums, so much so that NASA made a poster about it. Uh, makes layers of fury. And so the effects of the activity on the surface of the star were so awful, I thought this was a great star to work on because it could be an analogy for what we will have to do over the next decade in trying to find the Earth-sized world on, around quiet. So this is a Neptune mass planet, which has 30 to 40 times mass of the Earth. 
Um, and we were able to pull out the massive blue planet and distinguish that signal from activity which was 10 times bigger. No one on, a, on this planet, anyway, has ever been able to do that. We published it in Nature, um, and we found it looks like this didn't, my season case, oh no, actually there it is. I thought we were losing some slides there for a minute. We, yeah. I know it's time to wrap up, so I'm going to end here soon. But we, this system's so young, it tells us about planet formation. And we actually just submitted a proposal to the Webb Space Telescope to look at atmosphere, to learn about how atmospheres form. So we can learn about the star. We even looked at the transit happening dozens of times. And we found that the timings of the transits weren't regular. It was like a broken clock. Sometimes the transits would be slow. Sometimes the transits would be late. And if we plotted that as a function of time, the timing of the transits, turns out there was we got another planet in the system. Turns out this one is an Earth-sized one. Uh, and we're still working on figuring out what its orbital period is. Uh, but we were the first ones. That, we actually almost got scooped. Um, but we, we uh, partially got scooped on this discovery. But we were able to figure out that it had to be from another planet as opposed to a star. And there's more to come from the system. Uh, we saw the planet pass behind the star, too, and some tiny amount of light disappeared. But it looks wrong. Too much light disappeared, and it lasted a little bit too long. And then we looked at how big, how much the amount of light the planet was blocking as a function of wavelength. And in the visible, the planet appears bigger than it does in the infrared. And that's unlike any other world known. There's only one other system, which also happens to be a young planet, K230 AD, discovered by the Kepler mission. And then we looked at it with a sister space telescope. And you see weird features. If you remember the light curve I showed you, it could just be like a little trapezoid disk in brightness. So we have a bump here and a bump here and some arc in the middle there. Long story short, we may have found one of the very few examples of a planet that still has debris around it. I wouldn't call it a ring system, more like a disk around the planet. And we're actively following that up today. There's lots of questions that remain. Looking towards the future, there's one more couple of slides. The James Webb Space Telescope has launched. You've heard about that in the news a lot. We actually used our campus observatory to watch it after it launched. And this is the James Webb Space Telescope as it was journeying about a, to about a million miles away from the Earth to where it is today. And Something weird was happening there. You could see it blink. So I plotted the brightness as a function of time, and it was spiking in brightness, and it was symmetric. I accidentally discovered, talked to my NASA colleagues on the mission, and they're like, yeah, you have to take the <laughs> But they were doing that to thermally uh, balance it out. So think about that. So we were using our telescopes to watch another. So James Webb has done a number of amazing things for exoplanets and so fast, but so far they haven't found any Earth-like atmosphere on the Southeast One system. And but the future is very bright, and we may be able to detect Earth atmospheres of Earth-like worlds with James Webb Space Telescope over the coming some years of operation. And maybe if we get lucky, see signs of life. If we don't see signs of life with JWST then we're definitely going to be looking at respect worlds in the 2040s with that joint And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so the trapezoid system is pretty close. Uh, it has a very dim star. 
it's, it's not that far. It's definitely more than 30 light years, but I don't remember. Uh, so the light itself is, you know, you it. no, uh, but um, I forget the distance to it, but let's just say it's 50 light years and the light would be 50 years. Human light time scale. With our campus telescope, we look at maybe a hundred nights a year. Yeah, at least fifty percent is lost to that. Uh, I but we can't be having it on campus for its education and outreach and research. Being able to put new instruments on it, test it, and all that like it's very nice. But we do. I actually one of my goals in my career is to work with other Virginia universities to get a buy-in from one of the big companies. But Mason doesn't have the money. But it's gonna have to Well, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, so I actually have eight undergraduate students in the research group uh, currently. Uh, the way they did to get in touch with me is by sending me an email. Um, and, um, and that's the way that they can start. Or they can, then they can Google me. My last name is very Googleable on the top result. Um, and uh, from there, you can find my email address. So, so the micro lensing technique I did not talk about today, and the micro lensing technique will find some Earth-sized cold world. Micro lensing technique is interesting. It relies on the principle of general relativity that masses send light. I didn't have time to talk about it, but it's um, it's not being used by the James Webb Space Telescope for a few reasons. Number one, micro lensing missions need to look at a huge half of sky. Preferably towards the galactic bulge, the center of our galaxy, where most of the stars are. Because in order to get the precise enough alignment of the transit we saw in stars, we get micro lensing alignment where one star actually the lens of the other through the gravity is about a one in a million chance. You have to look at hundreds of millions of stars at the same time in order to see these events. Uh, and you need a huge field of view. So the James Webb Space Telescope won't do it, but the Roman Space Telescope will, and that's going to launch um, towards the end of the day. So that is a good question. What is the interaction between the planets I've discovered and the disk of debris around them? And there's another observatory called ALMA, which uses radio wavelength observations, we call submillimeter wavelength, to get very high images of very young stars, even younger than this system. So this system is a probably 20 million years old. It sounds like a long time until you realize this time is five billion years old. So this is not even a toddler, you know, stellar ages. But the, the Alma space telescope is able to look at stars even younger, where the planet formation process is still ongoing even earlier than this. They can't see the planets directly, but they have been able to see gaps forming in those disks of gas and dust. And the only explanation that has that makes any sense is planet form. But they can't see the planet form. So, but well, yeah, I mean, one of the areas that we're looking at here with this discovery is um, how does the formation of this planet relate to the formation of that disk of debris that we see further out away from the star? And they're pretty far apart dynamically. So, it's, well, we do know that this disk has moving once in it, we don't know why. There's still a lot of mystery to unravel. Yeah. Yeah. So AI has been used for a long time, even going all the way back to the Kepler mission. Uh, specifically, it started out with classification. 
So it was used to take light curves, brightness of the stars in some point in time, and classify their behavior. Uh, so they might have a thousand candidates that were identified by hand, uh, and they tried to come up with a machine learning approach that could pull out those candidates independent of human input. Uh, so machine learning has been used for a long time in astronomy. Today, with the more advanced AI techniques that are available, such as large language models and um, uh, neural, you know, convolutional and deep neural networks, uh, long story short, they haven't seen too much use yet outside of classification and uh, There have been attempts to apply it to Doppler data, but that they found that the advanced machine learning techniques were really not that much better than just using some good old linear regression. So, so not yet to a point where it's shown huge advantage. One area outside of observational astronomy that's still an exoplanet where it has been very useful is simulating how planetary systems evolve with time. Taking a planetary system, a model planetary system, and a virtual planetary system, and moving the planet around in time according to the laws of gravity is very computationally intensive, and you have to use supercomputers. And people often just want to ask the question like, is the system stable? Will it last? And it could take a month of a computer, supercomputer time to figure that out. And wouldn't it be nice if there was a way to take some of the results and train an AI or machine learning algorithm to make that prediction easier? And indeed, those do exist, and they work pretty well, particularly the CNN and DNN types that are probably more be known uh, to um, predict the stability of uh, exoplanet systems, and they do it much better. So right now, most of the application is in uh, computational investment or computational training. Traditional uh, in terms of doing novel like theory or novel uh, data analysis, not so much. So we've already gotten really deep in statistics and machine learning at its heart is really a lot of data. a great question. Um, so the amount of change in brightness for transient time is the primary way we can tell the difference in time time. Uh, it's just a ratio of the areas of the planet to the star. Uh, but there are cases where a Jupiter-sized planet going from a sun-like star to the it may not be that. It could be a brown dwarf going in front of a sun-like star or you could have two stars passing right in front of each other, but they only just graze each other. We call that a grazing system factor, so that it looks like a dip from a Jupiter sized star. There's yet another false positive scenario where you have a bright star that you think has a planet, uh, and then two dimmer stars further away eclipsing each other. And then when you blend the light of those three stars together, they look like a single transient planet, roughly two per side. So there is a whole process in the follow-up of candidate planets discovered by the NASA Planck and Kepler mission in ruling out those false positives. I know that isn't exactly what you were asking, but um, but the orbital period is usually really set because we watch how often it happens. So so make it. But sometimes you may miss a transit. So you might think the period is twice as long or half as long. So there is follow-up work needed there to rule out if it's half the period or twice the period. Uh, in fact, the discovery I made here with the NASA test mission, going back to this data set, it's very interesting. We saw a transit of the planet here and a transit of the planet here. So we thought the orbital period was 17 days. Turns out there was a third transit that happened in the gap in the data. So that's why we went and took the Spitzer Space Telescope observations to see if it was the period or half the period. Um, so there is some, so follow-up work is really the answer. The, um, the follow-up observations that you do uh, include ground-based light curves like these. Uh, we take Doppler spectroscopy to see if the star is moving a lot. 
So we plot the velocity of the function of time on time and time. Right. So if it was a more massive planet, the change in velocity of the star would be much bigger. Uh, and so one of the vetting processes we do, but it's really hard to do that. So we try to do the other things. Yeah, there's and there's like a dozen statistical things that we do to make it hard for us to do this. It's really bad. Yeah. That was just in the news uh, from the James Webb case. So they're calling them Jumbo. Did anyone see that press release in the news? So the, oh, you got some nodding heads yet? I don't believe them for the record. <laughs> uh, and I worked on something related to that about 13 years ago. Uh, but long story short, free floating plants are plants that potentially form independent of their star or form to orbiting the star. And due to the dynamical instability around when our, you know, the star was this age, um, it may have come too close to another planet and gotten scattered, you know, or gone too close to the star, and picked up enough velocity to get kicked out of the planetary system altogether and become a free-floating planet. Some of these planets are also nicknamed Steppenwolf planets. It's like an older reference that not everyone knew yet. Um, but uh, there are these worlds that have been discovered through microlensing, which is what we asked about earlier, and also from their thermal glow when they're very young. So one of the planets I discovered in 2010 was one of these thermal glow young planets in the star forming region. It was, it was uh, hot enough that we could see it glowing by itself and there was no star that it was orbiting. So um, they exist. There's a couple dozen that are known now. Um, and there's probably a lot more. It's just most of them are too cold to see. And speaking of which, um, we think that the number of free floating plants probably outnumbers the number of stars. Uh, and we know that the average number of plants per star is probably over six. Uh, and we know that the number of Earth sized worlds orbiting sun like stars is about one in ten, up to about one in four. So somewhere between one in four and one in 20. So Say one in ten to be a little conservative. Um, there are those worlds now. Do they have liquid water? Do they have atmospheres? Do they have ambient fields? We don't know, but that's an amazing number. When we realize that there are roughly 400 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy, that means there's potentially 40 billion Earth-like worlds in our galaxy alone. There's over 100 billion galaxies in the universe. That's a lot of worlds to start with. So what are, um, James Webb actually did make some interesting discoveries about that just recently. These are some of the slides I should have talked about, but you'll have to explain that. Um, we have found evidence of water vapor in hot Jupiter-sized worlds. Um, and water is very common in the universe. So the whole alien hypothesis coming from our water, it's not why it's there. <laughs> so don't believe the, the movie um, Independence Day. We wouldn't come here for that. There's water everywhere. There's much easier ways to get it. Um, so um, we do think that water is ubiquitous in the universe uh, and very common. The question is how much of it ends up on worlds like our Earth. We don't know. There have been simulations. And so one of the goals of this mission in 2040 is to answer a question like that. What is the percentage of Earth-sized worlds that are the right type temperature that have water evidence in their atmosphere? And so far, JWST hasn't seen any evidence of water in a world smaller than the Jupiter-sized planet as of today. Here's an example. Uh, this is a plot of the bright, the, the size of the amount of light blocked by a transient planet as a function of wavelength. Very confusing plot. But um, they basically can't tell the difference between a water world and a no atmosphere. 
so. But we might be able to have enough data in the next 10 years to do that and answer that question. Did they call this a super Earth? More like a mini Neptune. Uh, and so it may have a methane rich or hydrogen rich atmosphere. I think they actually rule out, yeah, they are able to rule out a methane rich atmosphere. So it could be a water world or a barren world, and we don't know. So we might get an answer to that question sooner, but this one told me a dim, dimmer red one. Um, Oh, that's actually a great question. Um, so pretty good. Uh, the, if the star forms in a dense stellar neighborhood, and there have been some papers trying to estimate how many interstellar objects are already in our solar system that have just been orbiting there for billions of years, like as a Oort cloud object or as a Kuiper belt object. In terms of a whole planet, um, hard to say. So. Um, Stars in general, once they're born, they disperse. Uh, so they go off college, they're towards Nathan, they go off on their own, they form a new stellar nursery that can be more densely packed. That's the time you can get material transfer. That's the highest probability of material transfer between stellar systems, particularly where there's lots and lots of stars, like let's say in the Orion star forming region. But long story short, oh God, oh, if you take, say, our sun's neighborhood right now, Take our sun and shrink it to the size of a grapefruit, put it here on the selection. The Alpha Centauri system has two planets, one slightly bigger than our sun, one slightly smaller than our sun. But imagine two more grapefruits. How far away do you think I'd have to put them? Catch them, if you think that. And here, one in Fairfax, it's a big guess. Get it to scale. So if I shrunk this, if I shrunk the universe, but the sun was the size of a grapefruit. Sun here, so we have a guess that the, the pair of grapefruits for Alpha Centauri A and B be in Fairfax. Any other guesses? Yeah. Wait, let's try to get the energy up. Washington, D.C.? Okay. The answer is Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, the distances between stars compared to their sizes enormous and the scale of our universe is oftentimes beyond human consciousness. It's a very very I knew I knew I knew get to the morning question. Uh thank you Lance for coming through tonight. Um uh, so um So using today's human technology, there is a plan in place to send essentially a computer motherboard the size of a cell phone via a solar sail powered by lasers um, to the Alpha Centauri system at a tenth of the speed of light. So it takes four years. Uh, and that's the closest star system to our own. So using the technology that we know of, it is not possible at this time to be traveling between the stars, but there are still many mysteries in the universe. Uh, one thing I do want to say is though, is that there was an interesting paper that said that the better way for aliens to traverse the galaxy is to be patient and opportunistic. Turns out that right now, the Alpha Centauri system is the closest one to the sun. A couple of million years ago, there was a star that was a lot closer. So instead of that journey taking 40 years, you might be able to do it in two. So in the future, that will be true too. Actually, people have made thoughts of when the next nearby stellar flyby is. They happen every three, few million years. So if you're an alien civilization looking to spread across the galaxy using technology as you know it, the best way to do it is to be patient. And wait every few million years for that bright star to fly by and hit the ride uh, at that time rather than trying to do it um, all at the same time. Now, do I want to say more than that? Uh, I think that's good enough. Any other questions? Yeah, I'll stick around for any more questions if you don't want to ask them in front of everybody. I'll stick around. <laughs>